a little bit about uh, molecular dynamics uh, simulations of DNA nanostructures. And before I start, I'm just curious how many of you have ever done a molecular dynamics simulation? Please raise your hand. Some. Okay, very good. So some, but not like um, only 30%. Okay, so uh, also I'm curious, how many of you used CADNANO? Well, okay. CADNANO wins. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, so here's the usual slide uh, on uh, processes and biomolecular systems. And uh, it's also something that we are uh, looking at at the center. Um, you know, the processes, they can span various uh, times and, and land scales. From um, individual atoms, like here, there's an ion coming to bind uh, uh, a loop of a protein to uh, cell colonies, right? So there's this uh, uh, multiple uh, uh, multiple scales involved in the process, uh, also in terms of space, but also in terms of time. Uh, so uh, my group is uh, predominantly interested in processes that happen somewhere here, so starting from all atom structure to the cell of, of organelles. And there we are developing methods and tools to work with molecular dynamics, all atom molecular dynamics, and uh, coarse grain models such as Brownian dynamics, Langerian dynamics. So I'm going to tell you about Molecular dynamics, a few slides in general, what it is, and then I'm going to show you some examples specific to, to DNA nanostructures. All right, so, so look, here's, uh, here's our instrument. Uh, the, the computational microscope, so this uh, term was uh, coined by uh, Klaus Schulte uh, some time ago, and uh, it really is a microscope, right? So for example, uh, look what it can do. Uh, here's a, here's a, a simulation. Uh, uh, if you're interested, how we've done it, I'll ask me later. All of the DNA right over here <laughs> comes together into an, an eye shape. Oh, uh, uh, okay, so that uh, caught your attention. Uh, now, um, what is molecular dynamics simulation? Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a physics-based method to study a microscopic system. So what we need to do, really, first we have to have an all-atom model of things that we want to study. So once we have that, then we can animate that model in time uh, and describe how it behaves. How it behaves when you apply electric field to it, or you push on it, or just by itself. So typically, uh, that of course comes with a price. Um, uh, first of all, you know, those uh, computers are not cheap. And second, uh, um, uh, because you're looking at individual atoms, you're kind of limited with the time scales, time steps that we can use in our simulations, typically femtoseconds. So we have to look at the system every, you know, two femtoseconds, uh, <coughs> which uh, adds up very quickly, uh, which is why the, the time scale typically accessible to microdynamics methods are of the order of microseconds, I would say. Um, it's possible to do millisecond simulations, but you need to have a special purpose computer for that. On the other hand, you get everything. You get everything you want, everything you want to know about it, you get it, like every atom and everything. So in that sense, it's powerful. Uh, the resolution is sub angstroms. You know the force on every atom and so on. So it's a computational force microscope. Just as any microscope, it, uh, it has its uh, uh, limitations and advantages. So, uh, uh, how many of you are physicists? So, 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 so the physics, so sorry, the, the physics here is here, F equals M A, right? So that's all there is really in the, <laughs> uh, in the, in the method. I'm going to explain it a little bit more. So here's a, a fancy way of writing F equals M A. So physicists rejoice. It's, it's the second derivative. Uh, that's uh, that's the acceleration. Um, so. Imagine this is a, this is an atom, um, and uh, and its acceleration is is determined by the force, right? So all we need to do is find out what that force is, right? And uh, and that is really uh, uh, the question here. Uh, the field of microdynamics has been around for many years, 30 plus years. So there was a Nobel Prize awarded for for it uh, a couple of years back really for developing this 
the, the, the functions that describe the interaction between atoms. It's not a simple function, you know, it's not a, uh, yeah, well, you'll see it in a second, but uh, so keep in mind, it's, it's, it's quite complex, but uh, the underlying physics is, is simple. We are approximating everything that happens quantum there with a the classical description. And the reason why we can do it is because there is a clear separation of scales. You know, electrons move a lot faster around nucleus than atoms. And that's, that's why it works. Really, I mean, in a sense, it's a quadrant model because we are considering quantum stuff. Uh, but, but it's a classical description of, of molecular processes. So this is, a mole this is the energy function. It has two parts. So there are chemical bonds and non-bonding interactions. Let me show you what they are. So basically what we do, we say, okay, we don't want to solve quantum equations. We know the chemistry. We know that you know, two atoms are form bonds and that the atoms can also be arranged under a certain angle or four atoms can have a certain dihedral angle in them. So that is something that you know from chemistry and that's structural knowledge. When we solve the structure of, of a protein, we already know where atoms are, right? So, um, so that's how, how we describe chemical bonds. Uh, and that is approximated using simple functions. Typically everything, if you, if you, deep, uh, if you dig into, into any kind of code, eventually you find that everything is harmonic oscillator one way or another. So this is also the case because you know, two atoms are connected by a, a, a spring. So here's a potential, this is harmonic oscillator. Uh, two, uh, three atoms, they are under angles that can kind of fluctuate like that. Again, it's a harmonic oscillator and so on. But uh, what's, uh, what's key here is that this function is specific to specific atom types. So there are probably, there are, I think, 120 atom types. And so it's a very complex function once you write it down. If you write it down for proteins, then you'll have lots and lots of terms. Although each of them is simple, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's quite... Uh, Difficult to solve and other difficult to solve. All right, and what else is there? Uh, there are also so called non bounded interactions. So that's between atoms that are not connected by chemical bonds, right? So, so here, here's, a, here's really the, the, the important concept. When we do microdynamic simulations, we split chemistry and non chemistry. Everything that has uh, bonds is, is, is empirical, but the non bounded interactions, we actually use physics to describe them. So we have a Van der Waal interaction, this is a Leonard-Jones potential, and we have uh, explicit charges, so each atom has a partial charge. Two charges interact us uh, uh, using a Coulomb law, and there's this uh, uh, permittivity of back. So, so, so that's it. Um, so another important concept to realize is that uh, microdynamics is a very general approach. So you can simulate pretty much anything in biomolecular field with the force fields. How is it possible? It's possible because instead of parameterizing individual proteins, we are parameterizing individual parts of the protein. So, so really the force field is split into chunks that have been parameterized over 30 years to reproduce their property very well. Uh, the, the bonds from the structures, the vibration uh, from a spectroscopy, so all of that comes together. So then if you want to simulate a different protein, you don't have to reparameterize. So one question people frequently ask, well, well, how many adjustable parameters are in your force field? Actually, there aren't any adjustable parameters in the force field because it's fixed by the field. OK? OK. So there's one limitation to classical microdynamics. Uh, once your chemistry is, is fixed, it cannot change, right? So you cannot expect a chemical reaction to happen. What you can do in practice, you can say, okay, now a chemical reaction happens and go to a different model, but chemistry is not there. So here's a, like, a, I, I made this slide, as you can see this morning. Uh, what do you need to run a molecular dynamic simulation? It's a very practical thing. And uh, so there are a couple of things, obvious things, you need a computer to do it, uh, yeah. The bigger, uh, the better. Then you also need to have a, 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 a code, a, a program that runs it, right? And there you have a choice. So the one that we develop is an AMD. You can also use Bramwax, Charm, Ember, and there are quite a few programs. Not all of them are the same. You know, some are good for some cases. Uh, so we are really stuck with NAMD. Also, if you want to run a simulation using Bramwax, we can also help you. 
Uh, and then finally, you need to start with something. So typically, we need to have some kind of input coordinates. If we look at uh, uh, proteins, so that typically would come from a protein database. Uh, for DNA, uh, we can have a very good guess. And uh, part, part of the reason why we are successful with the DNA origami is because we have a pretty good guess you know, what, what it is like to start with. As long as it falls, you know, we can make a good guess and then go from there. So you need the coordinates, but then remember the force field needs to know information about chemistry. And that is something that you need to put in. Well, not you as you, but there is a program that does it for you. But at the end of the day, you get another file which basically tells which atom is connected with which atom. So that's, uh, that's the chemical bonds, protein structure file. Uh, and then you need the, the, the parameter file, you know, all of those uh, uh, coefficients in the, in the potential function. So that goes into the parameter file. So those three things are essential. And then depending on the program, you would also have a, a file, the configuration file that actually runs the simulation. That's where you specify things like what's the time step, uh, what's the temperature, what's the pressure in the system, and so on. So it can be quite long file. Um, we've provide you with a good starting example that are publication quality. So if you run it and then end up, uh, yeah, and it ends up being part of your paper, you know, it's, you, I won't be ashamed. And, uh, and then there are all other things like uh, constraints, files, that sometimes you need for some kind of simulation. So this is all input. And at the end of the day, what you get out of it is a trajectory. So by trajectory, we mean uh, it's a set of snapshots of how system involves in time. So in a way, it's think about it like a movie of your system. And uh, if you were to have a, a very sensitive X-ray detector to take an X-ray movie, that's pretty much what you would see. Finally, once you have the trajectory, you also need to look at it. And that's where uh, analysis tools come about, such as uh, VMD, Python, and, and that's it. What are the, what, what is it good for? Right? It's kind of very broad uh, 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 overview of uh, what I think it's good for. Um, so first of all, to, for it to be useful, you have to have a well-defined starting condition, meaning structure, or or it can be disordered state. You know, as long as it, it's uh, as long as you're not trying to fold proteins, it's it, it's all right. Um, um, Ideally, the process that you're interested in would have minimum chemistry. So as, as I said, you can't really expect chemistry to happen. Volume, uh, so this really uh, keeps uh, increasing with every year. So right now, I think the biggest simulations that we've done was actually larger than this one. It was 140 million atoms. Uh, so at the center, we have a 4 billion atom simulation. So we are not yet at the point where we can simulate the whole cell in all atom, but we will be there probably in five years. So if, again, given the limitations that we can run only for so long, but uh, but in terms of size, there is really no problem. Uh, yeah, and process is taking less than 100 microseconds. It's very difficult to do both large system and, and long. Then you really need a huge computer. So the questions it really depends. It's kind of depends on your creativity, what you want to do with it. But the typical ones are, so what is the equilibrium structure in, of something in a physiological environment? Uh, you might think it's a boring question, but it actually it's it's some, somehow it's very important just to to get an idea. You know what is it like? Right? Does it stay in one shape? Does it fluctuate? And uh, how it behaves when you put it in water? Um, uh, more you can ask more quantitative questions, and I think free energy calculations that's really the the, the golden standard here. You can ask the question: How much free energy does it cost to to go from state A to state B? Or you can ask the question, how do you go from state A to state B, right? What is the minimum free energy pass? You know, all of those uh, um, interesting questions, you can get a quantitative answer. And there is a separate tutorials and workshop on that. But I'm just bringing it up. That, that's, that, that can be. Molecular dynamic simulation can be provide quantitative information. Uh, another thing that, that we do in my lab a lot, like what happens to the system when you expose it to external forces, uh, electric fields, how does it respond? And uh, But the most common question that I got from my colleagues is, what's going on in my experiment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. 
So let's, let's move on. So I'm going to show you two slides. Uh, the questions that I frequently get, and it's a very good question, like, uh, does it actually work? I mean, is, is it reliable? Like, can you trust the outcome of, because at the end of the day, it's, it's, a, it's a simulation, right? Is it real? And uh, and the question, the answer, the honest answer is, it, it depends on what kind of system you are looking at. Um, in the case of DNA, uh, systems that are made of double-strand DNA, I think we are at the point where we, we, we are getting quantitative accuracy in our predictions. So let me just illustrate how it works. So here's one system that we made to benchmark our, our accuracy of our methods. So it, is, it was designed to reproduce some gold standard experiments by Barsijan and co-workers, where they used uh, somatic stress to put bundles of DNA together. So here's how it works. We take a DNA molecule, not one, we put a bunch of them, uh, literally 64, and then we add uh, ions. So those are special ions uh, called spermins. They have a charge of plus four. We add usual ions, sodium chloride, and then we add water. So in all atom molecular dynamics, you have everything. So every water molecule is represented explicitly. And then what we did, we confined this uh, bunch of DNA to remain at a certain, in, in, in a cylinder of a certain volume, why uh, ions can pass in and out. But what we can do, we can measure the effective pressure that, uh, that uh, the DNA exerts. <laughs> And we can just run it. By the way, most of the simulations, most of the useful simulation with explicit water are done in purity boundary conditions. So usually, although you're seeing only this, it's actually an array, an infinite array in all three dimensions of this, of this system. And then we can ask the question, like, what is the internal pressure versus distance between the array? And, uh, and basically, with our model, we're getting right on. So uh, I have. I'm not going to explain what you're looking here. My point is quantitatively, we can reproduce experiments with regards to the magnitude of interactions between DNA in those confined structures, which make us, makes us think that we are in a good uh, uh, position uh, to simulate uh, self-assembled DNA structures where you have lots of DNA packed into one space. All right. So how did we get into uh, DNA origami simulations? We were actually, uh, it, it started, we were, a big part of my lab does nanopore work. And uh, the friend of mine, early Kaiser, he uh, at some point made those DNA origami nanopores. He asked, well, uh, can you simulate them? And uh, the usual answer is, yes, sure. And, uh, but to simulate them, we had to first uh, simulate origami. and. Uh, I was very fortunate. So Ji Jung Yu, so he was a, a postdoc in my lab. He now has a lab in Korea. Uh, so he got interested in this uh, project. And what he did, he wrote a converter. And uh, it was a simple Perl script by content. So that would take a Cadena design and, uh, and transform it into an atom structure. So typically, that's what you get from Cadena. Um, so this is just a 4x4 four four, uh, road. But then with a the converter, uh, you have an idealized uh, representation of it in all atom. So what we do next is we add water and we add solvent. Most of the experiments, you know, they're done in, in well, experiments typically done in different buffers, but the common one would be like one or more magnesium chloride or something like that. So it really depends what your experimental conditions are. That's what you put in. So ideally, one we always trying to match it one to one, and uh, yeah, and uh, it was a system, and then we run it, and at the end of the day, we obtain a trajectory. So just to give you an idea of what you're looking at, you're looking at at, at various planes of the structure. So it's a, it's a kind of a boring structure road, but you can already see that uh, something happens here. You, know, you can see this chicken wire, I mean chicken wire pattern where you have. Two DNA molecules, you know, they, they pull apart, connected by the crossovers. And, uh, and uh, typically, how do we know that our simulation is, is, has reached uh, an equilibrium state? We are looking at things like, what is the root, root mean square deviation of atoms from initial uh, uh, placement? And in, in case of uh, DNA origami, we're looking at the number of 
base pairs that are broken. So some number of base pairs is broken, especially at the ends, but mostly it remains stable. So what we got out of this paper, we also showed that it's possible um, to, to use these local fluctuations to compute, to, to, to determine local elastic properties of the DNA. Uh, so here's an example of a so-called chicken wire representation. So you see each of the strands is represented by a black curve. So you see there is a crossovers and it's colored by the local DNA DNA distance. So you can clearly see that uh, the distance is, uh, is non uniform. But uh, if I play a movie now, you can also see, get an appreciation of how much fluctuations have. So it's not a static structure, as Sean said, you know, it's, it's, it's highly, quite dynamic. And by knowing how much things fluctuate around, we can uh, use uh, Trenot uh, theory to, to determine everything you want to know about local mechanical properties. You can integrate it and get some prediction about persistent lengths and stuff like that. All right, so that was our first uh, uh, excursion into DNA origami field. And, uh, and uh, based on that, we have a tutorial for you today. Uh, it's called the Practical Guides to DNA Origami Simulations Using NMD. So in that tutorial, you will basically reproduce that one. I mean, it's slightly smaller system, so it's a little bit more tractable for your laptops. But step by step, you know, if like imagine we didn't publish it, and you just happen to find this tutorial, you will be able to publish it. So it's it's a research grade. Uh, description and, and everything is there. So you just go like that and compute all of the graphs. All right, so <clears throat> we originally uh, were targeting only uh, DNA origami uh, and the simulations, but there are other methods that people use. Uh, for example, NanoEngineer has been around for a very long time. Uh, I don't know if people still use it. Uh, we have some designs that people still use uh, as NanoEngineer. So it turns out that it's fairly straightforward for us to write a converter for, for those things. So we have a converter for nano engineer. And uh, it's also possible to simulate things like DNA bricks that Sean uh, introduced briefly uh, today. So in this particular work, we uh, wanted to compare origami to bricks one to one. So we designed the same structure uh, using origami and using bricks. And if you look at it closely, you don't see much difference. Uh, uh, there, there are very subtle differences in the way the junctions are, 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 uh, are behaving and, uh, and slight difference in the curvature. But overall, they two are very comparable. But uh, if you're interested in modeling those systems, we also have a, a tool for it. All right, so we have another tutorial, which we would call it's all atom tutorial. This one, I highly recommend. If you're interested in this one, you do it after doing the first one. This one is, uh, is a way for us to support all other tools that people have put uh, together. And uh, so we have a, a script that you can take a can do output and, and run a simulation on it. Uh, so okay, now, now. so OxDNA is another modeling uh, uh, platform that is fairly popular. It's post grain model. So we have a, a, a description of how you can go from OxDNA to all atom and see it works. Nano engineer, Vhelix, uh, did all those in TMAT. So TMAT, our TMAT support is actually through CAMP. But you know, if you have a design file that you were uh, interested to see how it looks in all atom, give it a try. So that's this other tutorial, uh, and then Energy MD, uh, a toolkit, a universal tutorial. So you have two all atom, and um, you can try them. Okay, so let me switch gear a little bit and ask a question: Like when we actually simulate DNA origami? Do we, do we get the structures that make sense? You know, as you can probably realize that I'm a cautious person uh, and uh, we want to make sure that uh, our tools uh, produce results that are reliable. And uh, with, uh, with origami, it's not exactly clear what to compare it to because as you know, they, they don't crystallize well. And uh, at the time, the only uh, 3D model that was experimentally derived was this, uh, Pointer structure by by Henry Dietz. and uh, so we wanted to see you know to to, to see who, who wins here, Petascale Computer or or, or Cry AM. And all right, so here's the design. So this is the pointer structure, uh, and uh, typically with a Cry AM you obtain a bunch of images at cryogenic temperatures, and then you arrange them to produce a, a 3D 
density, the electron density that then you can reinterpret in terms of whole atom model like that. So this is an atom model derived from higher ion structure described in this uh, publication. And we were uh, very uh, naive, I don't know, or optimistic. Uh, and we decided, well, let's see what happens if we just uh, build our ideal structure, put it in a box of water uh, with ions and just run it. So it was one of the larger systems that we simulated at that time. And uh, so let's see what happens. So here's our structure. So on the right, it's our structures. On the left is, is the density, I mean, a model derived from the density. So let's see. So you can see it kind of uh, deviates from an from a, from a initial shape, uh, not by a lot, but, but considerably. And uh, it looks like it's going into the right direction. So here's another view of the same simulation. So you see this, for example, those helices, they, they start tilting. And here's another one. So at the end of the day, what we can do, we, we got our model, and we can now make a density out of it. And, uh, and now the question is, uh, which one is which? Yeah, which one is a cryom, and which one is a latum? And I actually don't know. Oh, here it is. So this one is a latum. So it looks similar. I mean, there are, of course, differences if you look closely enough. For example, in the crime density, you don't resolve the, the single-stranded uh, parts that are usually added to prevent propagation. And um, yeah, so we can make this movie where we uh, compare the two densities. Uh, one is uh, in, uh, in, in red, the other one is blue. I'm really bad with colors. If it's not red, but uh, pink. and, and Violet, uh, please forgive me, but uh, you can see that there are two. And uh, so basically, we were able to reproduce very simple features in that uh, structural design, you know, including this, uh, this pattern of the solars. And uh, it will be now like a stacked structure somewhere. Somewhere there. So overall, we were quite happy with the result. And for us, it was uh, a validation that. Uh, our you know brute force, so to say, molecular dynamics gives structures that are within the resolution of the cryo reconstruction. So if you were wondering, you know, how did you guys make movies like that? And can I make a movie like that too? We have a tutorial for you. So, so you can do the same thing. It's called the uh, images, uh, making images and animations of DNA nanostructures with VMD. So for some of them, you'll need an atom structure. Some of them would just take like a nano design, and you can make things like that. So here's a here's a pointer structure. Now it's rendered a little bit fancy. So you see there's this transparent surface and uh, and and a plane and then stuff like that. You can also animate trajectories. So here's the ones that we did for uh, voltage sensing. Uh, Paper where you see this DNA plate is, is being sucked in by electric field. Uh, and uh, also, we have an example of a movie where you go basically between different representations. You can fly through it, zoom in, so all of that stuff. Uh, if you have your design, I think it, you can just try doing it for your design. All right, so, so we were very happy with this pointer simulation, uh, but uh, it was a hero simulation. You know, I'm not going to fool anyone. There are a few groups in the world who can do that simulation just because you need a really big computer. Well, now that we have the trajectory, we start thinking, well, do we actually need all of that uh, water thing? Like, do we really need to have it? And can we get away with having less uh, water? But we still want to have an atom structure. That's how we come up with something that we call energy MD which stands for Elastic Network of Restrained Guided Molecular Dynamics. So basically, the idea here is the following. So from all atoms, we know that origami, they just form this chicken wire pattern. Well, very good. So what they can do is, and that, and that pattern develops because in water, helices, they repel because they're charged, right? So what we, we can do, we can now say, OK, now, why don't we just remove all of the water? And once, if we know locally what is the pattern of uh, uh, of local distances, we just enforce it on the structure. So really, in this kind of simulations, it's done in vacuum. 
but it's done on all atom structure. So you have everything is there, uh, and it's about uh, 10,000 times more uh, efficient. So in the case of pointer structure, we get data like within a nanosecond, it basically converges to prime density, uh, and yeah, it's 10,000 times more efficient. So that's something that uh, when we thought, okay, well, uh, that might be useful to someone who is not us. Uh, and uh, the, the first version of our tools was this energy MD uh, structure prediction server that is still operational. So what it does, it, 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 it gives you all the files for you to run the molecular dynamics. It doesn't run it uh, for you because it's still, Although it's not as computationally expensive as, as the solid simulation, it still takes uh, about uh, a day to run it. Uh, but all of the files are there, so you download archive, you just run it, and, and it works. So we have quite a few people using it. Uh, but that kind of started thinking, you know, can we actually make a tool that other people can use uh, easily? And, uh, uh, and that's how we uh, end up where, where we are. So some, some of you know that it's possible also to make curve structures. And with all that, we can also model core structure. So this one is a programmable band, and this is also from this 2013 paper. Uh, we can um, do it. We just start with the DNA that has those deletions and insertions, and then we realize the structure in steps. It actually, by itself, it will form the band. So the first field is uh, precise enough to, uh, to know in which shape it has to go. Right, so it's just, you know, when you do it with a lot of this is a little bit difficult. Uh, so that's why we developed this multi-resolution uh, DNA structure prediction tool, which you will hear more, more from Chris. But in, in one slide, basically what it does, it takes a, it takes a, a edge design, and then it goes through multiple levels of coarse graining, starting with a very, very coarse one, and then going into finer and finer details. And at the end of the day, we end up with an all-atom model. And, uh, and we have a story on that. You will hopefully go through it more. All right, so are there any questions so far? All right, so I'm going to use uh, the last uh, maybe 15 minutes to tell you, to give you an example why would one want to do an all atom simulations because it looks like, you know, I just argue that energy MD is so good and, uh, and you have coarse grain things, but there's still lots of things that you can discover with all atom simulations. You just have to find the right question to ask. And this question, the example that I'm going to give you is, uh, is our, from our recent uh, work with Ruhe Kaiser. So Ruhe Kaiser is an experimentalist at uh, Cambridge University in UK. And with him, we were wondering, we were working on the so-called problem of DNA uh, membrane channels. So we know in a cell membrane, uh, you have a zoo of, of, of proteins that facilitate transport of solid through the membrane. Some of them are signaling receptors, uh, some of them are channels, and so on. So there are quite a few of them. And many of them are medically relevant, like those uh, uh, G-coupled uh, receptors, you know, that's uh, a big uh, target for, for drug development and so on. Uh, there have been quite a bit of efforts to modify those channels experimentally, and that's usually not so simple with us to do, uh, because we still don't understand how membrane proteins fold. You know, when you hear, perhaps you heard that uh, protein folding is a solved problem, it usually applies to uh, water-soluble proteins. And with membrane channels, it's, it's a lot more difficult. So there was an interest in, uh, in the field in using DNA to, to design those channels. It was the first one uh, uh, coming from uh, um, uh, Eric Dietz and Fritz Simmer, Simmel uh, lab in Munich. So they built this uh, really uh, big uh, channel um, using, the, using the origami uh, method. And the reason why it worked, why it inserts into, into lipid bilayer, is because it has this uh, cholesterol anchors. So DNA is a hydrophilic entity. It doesn't want to go into, into lipid. But you can make its insertion energetically feasible by adding those cholesterol that very much like to go into, into the bilayer. So you have competing forces. And if, if everything works out, it actually will insert. 
So sometimes, uh, around the same time, there was an alternative design for uh, DNA uh, inserting pores. So this one is actually not an origami one. It's just a uh, tile-like. So you have several short strands uh, that uh, assemble into a bundle. And uh, the, the key here to making a membrane channel was that uh, this backbone was uh, made uh, uh, neutral. So DNA is usually charged, but once you remove this strip of, of charge and replace it with something uh, neutral or some mildly hydrophobic, it will insert. So that's a work from Stefan Kovorka's lab. And, uh, and there have been quite a few variants of the same structures. It really depends how you embed it. So another one, also from Stefan's lab, was to using this hydrophobic anchor. So you take a DNA that is a normal DNA, but what you do, you add at the end or at, at one of the bases is hydrophobic anchor, so it kind of embeds itself. So you, you play with the system uh, to make it uh, energetically uh, uh, feasible for it to insert into the bilayer. But what actually happens once it's inserted into the bilayer, that was the application that we wanted to study. So by the way, all of those channels, regardless of with the dramatic difference in size, like this one is probably 100 times bigger than this one, in terms of molecular weights, they all had the same conductance of about one downstairs. So I will use this to uh, I will use this example to to illustrate how we go about actually designing our simulation. So we wanted to study those channels, right? How they insert. So the first thing we do is we ask our our uh, our friends in the in the experimental lab. How do you make your channels, right? So how do you insert them? And the way they do it in the lab is the following. So make these vesicles. They insert uh, the channels into the vesicles. And then they are drawn onto the nanocapillary. And they form a bilayer membrane. And then the electric field is applied. And they measure the current. So that's the experimental setup. So we want to build a system that matches it as closely as possible using our tools. Of course, we are not going to build the entire capillary in a atom because it's actually a, a microscopic object. It's, it's, it's not going to be great. So we focus on this part. So how do we do it? Oh, yeah. So in experimentally, they apply the voltage, and they measure things like current versus voltage. So it's a standard physiology, standard physiology experiments, but they're done for the DNA system. So the first thing you need is you need to have a, a model. And uh, it can be either a Kenyano design or a Nano engineer design. Uh, so we, I think we worked uh, with both in this case. And then we have our converters. And we get our structures. So you see some of the structures look a little bit funny, like there are things stick out. Well, that's because you know, converters is just transcribes one design into all that. And of course, there will be some uh, Small imperfections of how it's done. Uh, but what we do next is, uh, but that all will be resolved once we start running this simulation. So we have a DNA, and we have a DNA here. What else are we missing? Um, so we run a short optimization simulation, so those things go away. But then the most important thing, we need to add cholesterol anchors. So those are the one that holds the DNA inside the lipid bilayer. So we go and add them over here. We have lipid bilayer membrane. So it's a disordered state. So it's something that we can model very well. Uh, we add. We add then magnesium. And uh, experiments are done in high salt. So we add water and we add potassium chloride. So we are matching experiment one to one at this point. The only thing that we are missing, we are missing all of all of this stuff, right? So we don't have the capillary, we don't have this uh, micron size aperture, but where action happens, it's reproduced one to one. And then what we can do, we can just apply electric field and see how ion conductance happens. So in a way, you can say it's kind of an observational experiment because we actually apply electric field and we see ion passing and then we compute the current. Right. So it's not really theory in a way because we actually do in computational experiments. And once you know the current, what we can do is we can plot the current as a function of voltage. We can tell where the current goes, well, how much of it goes through the middle, how much of it goes on the outside, and stuff like that. So we characterize it uh, uh, completely. We can get the ID curve, same as an experiment. And uh, yeah, 
So, so, so that's typical research. I mean, you can have a different system with different questions, but usually the way you go through the through the setup process is the same. Like, what is an experiment, and what can you model without giving away anything, right? And then once once at some point you have to make choices what you not model, uh, right? But if you can model everything, you do model everything. So what did we learn from it? And this is going to be a science part of my talk, was the five slides, I think. So a few things that we uh, learned from it was that the chemistry matters. So the way you embed those channels actually makes a difference. So the one that was embedded using this hydrophobic backbone, it formed a very nice, very uh, tight seal with the lipid bilayer. So if you look at the way the ions are actually passing through it, so you don't see much ions going here. Because, because it's a hydrophobic seal. And in contrast, if you look at the channels that were embedded using this uh, uh, porphyrin anchors, it's, it's slightly different. Because what you have here, you have a hydrophilic DNA, uh, and it's embedded into the, into the bilayer. So if you look at what happens to the head groups of the lipid bilayer, which is shown here, they, at the beginning of the simulation, the bilayer is flat, but then as you progress, You'll see the bilayer curved, starting, I mean, it's a projector, and you can see there's some density here, you know, it's like really forms like a menace. And, uh, and here is the schematic representation. So for those type of bilayers, you have those head groups actually facing towards the, the helix, right? And that is something that came out from a simulation. All the people previously also suggested that that's probably what happens. Uh, I think, I think, uh, in the, in the line paper papers, they specifically say that that's probably what happens. Uh, the way to see it was to do a simulation. And, uh, and uh, what uh, perhaps was more striking is that if you look where the current goes, we find that uh, actually most of the current goes outside of the structure. So one more time. In this particular case, that would be here at the interface. So we have a very leaky interface. The current goes around the helix, most of it. Some part goes through, but most of it goes around. So that's kind of bad news for designing it for ion channels. Uh, but it is what it is. And uh, so that information came from a simulation. And armed with that information, we designed a proof. So how do we prove it experimentally? So ideal projects with molecular dynamics where you go full, full circle. So you start with experiment, you do simulations, you make a prediction, and then you validate it in experiment. So our prediction was that, well, if you make a channel that has only one helix without a hole, it will conduct. And that's exactly what happened. So here's a design. You have a double-stranded DNA here, and it uh, has a porphyrin anchors. And this is a simulation. So immediately as we start, you see that the water will penetrate through the bilayer, forming a, a toroidal pore around the DNA. So that's where the ions will go. And, uh, and the prediction is that we'll get a certain conductance through this one helix channel. And we can simulate what the current is, and we can experimentally measure. And in this case, we can actually get the, the quantitative answer. So we simulate, and we get around 0.1 to Siemens, uh, which is 10 times less than the previous one. But more importantly, you know, we made a, a prediction, and it was validated. So there's another thing that we found, which was kind of interesting. We also looked, uh, now that we have the trajectory, right? So what, uh, and typically, that's what you do. You know, it's not so much, uh, once you know how to do molecular dynamics, it's not so much problem to run them. It's like what to do once you have it, right? What are you going to write your paper about? Uh, that's another way to look at it. And uh, one thing was that we looked at what happened to the, to the lipids. And uh, we found something very interesting here. Uh, so you see this lipid, it's one lipid out of many we just highlighted so you can see it. So it starts at the lower liquid, uh, but now because the membrane is curved, it actually goes all the way up here and goes to the other. Uh, and uh, it's not just one that we happen to have one uh, guy like that. It's quite common. Uh, here's another example. Now it goes from a top liquid to the bottom one because it's really, it's a diffusive process. So what we discovered here 
because of molecular dynamics and relational support, that once you curve the lipids, the lipids can diffuse through. You know, if you wouldn't have the structure there, it would never happen. The rate of spontaneous flip flop is like seconds. And here we see it in, the, in two microseconds. We got 16 of those. And uh, so we start looking at the literature, and then we discovered that there are actually enzymes in, 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 in our cells that do it. They're called scrambling this, uh, which function is to rapidly disrupt the composition of the lipid bilayers. So if you don't know it, uh, uh, most of the lipid bilayers in our cells are all asymmetric. So what's outside and inside is completely different for a reason, because what's outside is different from what's inside. But there are some moments in, in cell's life when you want to rapidly scramble it, scramble the lipids, and that is done by scramblase. So we were curious if, you know, if, if it's possible that we've just developed a DNA scramblase. And uh, so the way to prove it is the following, and it's a little bit technical. So what you do, you make a lipid vesicle uh, that has a uh, quenchable groups, and you look at it with a microscope. Then you add a reducing agent, so it will reduce all of the all of the fluorophores that are outside. So your fluorescence should, uh, if there is no scrambling, should should uh, decline to about 50 percent. But if you have scrambling, you know the lipids, the structure will continuously recirculate, flip the lipids, so that when you look at it in a in a microscope, the fluorescence should drop to, to zero. And prediction was that when we insert it, this would what happen. And that's exactly what happened. And uh, uh, so Alex uh, at Cambridge so he did this experiment. So our structure was like this. It's a portulates bundle with cholesterols. And we also did a couple of controls where we had only one cholesterol, zero cholesterol. And what I learned from this wonderful uh, collaboration is that uh, experiments with vesicles is really time consuming and messy. You know? Simulations, we got the result in a week. And I think it took two years to, to do it in the, in the lab because it's 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 an actual stuff. I really have big respect for experimental work. But at the end of the day, you know, we actually um, were able to show experimentally that our predictions were correct. So if we have a, a, a scrambling uh, device, basically all of the all of the so we can label the the fluorophores, we can label the DNA, and all the fluorescence go to zero. And if we have one that can attach but cannot insert, basically we go to 50%. So this way we kind of validate it. And again, it's a circle of, uh, of, of uh, a research project. We start with, uh, uh, with simulations that are designed to explain experiments. We find something interesting. We make a proposal to experimentalists to test it, and then they test it. And then everyone is happy. So as a kind of byproduct, you also find that it also works in, uh, in human cells. So you can insert it and pretty much kill the cell. Uh, where we go from there with this, I don't know. But uh, that was an unexpected direction that this work took us. All right, I'm almost done here. Just want to review again what uh, kind of tutorials you can have in the afternoon. Uh, so we have design and simulations and simulations and, uh, and, and images and voice. Um, we will uh, soon uh, go downstairs for uh, for our lunch and hopefully get our badges. So <laughs> let me finish showing this acknowledgement slide. Uh, uh, so there are two people who already left the lab. So Jiju and Yu, so he was the person really who did the first origami uh, and simulation, and that was the first version of the converters and Chen Yu. He does this membrane channel work. Uh, and this is my group. And we also do nanopores, as you can see from the t-shirts. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Is there any, like, is it interesting to flow the lipid bilayer? Is there any interest in that? So, the, so I was noticing the, the atomic simulations you were doing sort of showed the bilayer flowing. No, I mean it's. I think it's it's known that the, the lipid bilayer, at least uh, the synthetic one, is a fluid. It's a two-dimensional fluid, so you have uh, all kind of uh, uh, diffusion happening. Uh, like when you, it's it's in, interesting what happens once you start working, putting proteins there. 
So they can have different uh, height of the height of the player. So basically, you can have rafts floating in that. And uh, so uh, I think it's more, more or less as clear as they occur, but what they do in biology is not so clear. So have you tried long term stability of these critical channels? Huh? Long term stability of the light. Have you seen any sentences in different terms? Okay, that's a great question. Not only simulations, definitely. Yeah, so you can't go like long term. Uh, I, I don't think I can answer this question. Uh, so, what, uh, what we found that uh, in that experiment where we had the uh, cancer uh, breast cells, they, they died. So, yeah. Um, yeah, related, but I think you start the simulation from a situation that the DNA structure already penetrates the membrane, but can you simulate how it penetrates or can it do unconsciousness? We have attempted to do it. Actually, you've done it, right? Uh, yeah, we, I, I have, there's few, there's, I had a simulation inserted in the nanopore in the membrane, but that was not a real thing that we calculated. And I saw the results that that really shows some kind of finger decalculation of insertion of such nanopore in the membrane. But it's uh, difficult to um, convert finger to uh, all these calculations. So you can do it, but it takes really a lot of heavy calculations. It's also, very difficult because the process of insertion is spontaneous. Everything that is spontaneous is not great because uh, if you just run it, nothing will happen. Yeah. Uh, again, because of the time scale uh, limit. But if you have an idea how it happens, like if you have a hypothesis, it inserts by doing blah, then you can realize it in a simulation and compute the free energy cost associated with it, which you can then judge whether this hypothesis is correct or not. I'm a totally stranger of uh, the simulation part, uh, but do you see any room of uh, optimization of power measures, just the actual condition that I mean, experimental result and simulation result? I mean, you say that there's no room to adjust in the case of the cross field, and you just got uh, everything input, and then you get a result after calculation. Do you see any, I mean, I mean, it is a result. What you, you only can do is input the arrangement of the initial phase. Is it correct? Well, yes or no. I mean, the question was uh, like, uh, I guess the question was um, uh, how much freedom you have when you design these simulations, right? Mm, yes, because you said it is microscopy. In microscopy, it should uh, uh, represent the truth. I mean, not. Uh, Adjusted. Right. So, so, um, so the force field is one part. So the force field is uh, that describes the model of individual compounds. You know that is developed by by a field and it's involved. Right? In addition to that, uh, there are many ways you can use it. So you, don't, I mean, for example, if you are interested to change ion conditions, what will happen to the structure? Right. That you can totally do. If you change conditions and you find that, for example, the structure becomes more compact. And it is the same as experiment. I mean, it is the same I mean, as experiment. To, 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 to make them agree, the experimental result and simulation, can you do anything or there is no room to do? Well, usually there is there, there's no room to do it. I mean, there's no fudge factor, so to say, uh, most of the times. You know, sometimes, sometimes you can find that the force field is not good, right? And once we find that the force will is not good, then we can improve it and then use it again. But usually you need to have two sets of experiments. One is for your benchmark that you use to improve your force field, and then the other one that you do it for a different system. Typically we don't change it, you know, to match something. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. I'm uh, just wondering how can you distort the uh, lipids and cholesterol after you have optimized the DNA channel? So it's like 
Uh, if you can do that, then how can you just directly hack the DNA in that simulation software? Um, and do you have the convergence or something like uh, the uh, data engineer or? Oh, yeah. how we actually did it? Yeah. Yeah, so that one we wrote. Uh, yeah, so another engineer doesn't have cholesterol, right? Right. Uh, so we we wrote a script to to add cholesterol. So we had a model of cholesterol, so that's not a problem. We had to build a model of the linker, you know, because it's also linked. Right. I'll do that. So we have it. If you want, we can give it to you. Uh, but uh, basically, yeah, you write a script to do it. It's a custom one. Uh, it's it also depends how many people are interested in that. You know, if it's something that uh, that is as popular as origami, then we could probably have a button, you know, add a <laughs> add a thing there. But we, I mean, right now it's a script. Thank you. All right. So then let's uh, proceed to uh, search for again and have a uh, bunch there. Thank you. 